Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one, the dragon question. <laughs> if the dragon question is, are dragons real? Then, uh, no. The answer is no. This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for... <laughs> what? That's where we'd end today's episode. But this seems long. So I guess we're going to go into a bit of lore today about dragons. I feel dragons kind of fall in with that mermaidy vibe, right? It's like, just think about it for a second. How would it actually work? Like mermaids. How do they reproduce? What's going on, you know, below the waist? There's beneath, there's, how do you make more mermaids, is the question. And with dragons, it's like, yo, they don't, no. They're like dinosaurs, they don't exist. No, dinosaurs are real, and there's evidence for them. Dragons, not so much. Also, like, breathing fire and shit, that's like a dragon staple. How does that work? What, they just have, like, some special methane, some sort of fuel store inside, like, some special stomach, and they have a little spark maker in their mouth? that sets it on fire? How'd that even work? Fire-breathing dragon. It's just nonsense. I've ruined it for you. Anyway, thank you, Wills, for writing it. The uh, format of this show is I've never read it before. We're gonna read it and explore it, decode it together. Let's jump in. As the sun gently rose over the fifth century, Dinas Emery's, okay, one of the many rolling green hills of northwest Wales. Oh god, it's so close to where I'm from and yet it's so impronounceable. Welsh, what's up? It's like you go there and it's like all of these signs, they're in Welsh and in English. And in Welsh it's like... A friend of mine's Welsh. And uh, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> I was, I was gonna be asked, maybe he had some Welsh anecdote that I'll remember on the fly. It's like, no, I don't remember that at all. I just, he was Welsh. That's it. I don't think he could speak Welsh. Um, I don't know, can people from Wales generally speak Welsh? I'm not sure. But one of the funniest things I remember seeing about Wales was there was a road sign and it was like, you know, look, lorries over 10 tons or whatever cannot cross this bridge. You could take this path or whatever. And then that's what it says in English. And then underneath there's the Welsh version and it says, and it's an out of office email reply because they've sent it obviously to their Welsh translator and their Welsh translator has replied, like auto replied. And uh, yeah, the, the sign company just posted that on the sign because Welsh is so indecipherable from English that you're just like, they just, they thought that was what they were writing. And I guess they thought, yeah, the numbers as well, they could be translated into Welsh numbers, which for all I know could actually exist. Anyway, let's carry on. A weary group of stonemasons set out to continue work on what should have been, by now anyway, the majestic towers of a magnificent castle to none other than King Vortigern himself. However, what started out as a dream job, the type of project that creates a lasting legacy and, and one that many a stonemason dreams about, had become a soul-crushing defeat. As with every other morning, they were met with the same disheartening sight. All of their tools were missing, and all the work done the previous day had somehow become undone. What should have been walls was nothing but a pile of rubble, crushed stone, and broken dreams. There was only one thing left to do now. The time had come to call on the wizards. This is not history, this is a story. It's like, when something is like, and they went to work every day, and all the work was undone from yesterday, and yet the stonemasons continued their stone masonry. You're like, there's a, there's a lesson in here somewhere. Like, you know when you're reading a story and you know it's fake because there's a lesson, and the lesson is just a bit too obvious. Although, what's this lesson? If I went to work every day and someone had deleted all my videos from yesterday, I got no benefit from them, I would just not make more videos. I'd be like, what's the point? It's like, I mean, I like reading this stuff, but I also like people watching it. Would I read this every day in front of a camera without the record lights on? I mean, I've made that mistake a few times, but as a general rule, no. Why would you continue going to work if every day your your previous day's work has been destroyed? And be like, and that's the value of work ethic. No, it's not. I just want my money. I mean, sure, have a work ethic, but the, 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 you, you gotta have some reward for it, some, like, tangible thing afterwards. Even if that's just money. Now, when the king calls, you do what you're told, and after doing whatever magical men did those days, the assembled wizards finally came up with a solution. In order to remove whatever curse beset the construction work, the ground had to be sprinkled with the blood of a child born from a human mother and a father from the other worlds. Ah, some classic wizard sh after much searching, only one candidate was found. A young lad called Myrdin, better known today as Merlin. Oh, shit, as in Merlin Merlin from the, 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 the movie where he's got a big beard and the tea keeps pouring itself. 
Arthur? King Arthur? Something like that? I haven't seen it since I was a kid. This is one of those ones where I'm like, my knowledge now of this is extremely limited. But in a few years, my knowledge is going to be powerful because my kids are going to get to the age where they can enjoy these sorts of movies. Right now, we have to watch like f- Coco Melon and all these other bullshit ones where it's like, oh my God, could this be worse? And at some point, they're going to be able to enjoy movies like Arthur or whatever that shit was. And I'll probably be like, I get all nostalgic for it. Merlin, probably being a typical teenager, decided that dying in the name of construction was not how he wanted to go, and convinced King Vortigern that his castle was falling down every night because it was being built upon an underground lake in which slept two dragons, a white dragon and a red dragon. While modern engineering would suggest that it might have been the lake causing all of the trouble, back in the 5th century, the blame was placed squarely on those bloody dragons. The laborers got to work, and after digging into the side of the hill, discovered the lake that young Merlin insisted would be there. The lake was drained, and the two dragons awoke and started fighting. What is going on? This story is just getting crazier and crazier. It's like, how did they drain that lake? How, more importantly, how did you drain the lake without waking the dragons? This was the 5th century. You don't have some sort of magical pumps. Or maybe you do, because it's a made-up story with wizards. So it could be magical pumps. The red dragon was victorious, and the white dragon fled. And Vortigern could finally build his castle now that the problem was resolved. Merlin lived another day to become Arthur's right-hand wizard. And all was well, except perhaps of the white dragon. It was now sadly homeless. This is just one of thousands of tales of dragons spread across all continents and cultures. These days, we've replaced dragons with, well, science. But back in the age before mankind had a better understanding of how the world worked, dragons, like many other mythological creatures and tales of magic, were often used to explain natural cycles and catastrophic events from the dawn of creation itself to something as mundane as a ca- as castle walls falling down because the people of the time simply couldn't explain it away by other means oh don't get so like (laughs) sorry that sounds like i'm being mean to ilza i'm not i'm just like in general don't be so like oh yeah no in the modern world we don't have dragons anymore we have science please like we've gone beyond that it's like no 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 yeah we have science but we also have religion don't we it's like what's causing this uh this tornado that keeps destroying our land and our field it's like there are people who will be like it's the wrath of god for homosexuality or something insane like that and it's like people still believe this it's 2022 and it's like we've got science of it and believing that is as ridiculous as believing in dragons you fools but is there a grain of truth in the tales were dragons ever real after all every culture has stories of dragons there is art depicting dragons and written accounts of dragons both in literature and in history and even early naturalists considered dragons to be real animals not creatures of fiction i mean i'm willing to believe that there could be creatures like dragons like there are those little lizards and that look like dragons but do they breathe fire no (laughs) and i don't believe there's like any fossils of fire breathing dragons right that's not a real thing And all these dragons are so similar. Surely these tales must have been based on an existing creature, right? Well, the truth of it is is that to this day, historians and other people much smarter than me haven't been able to pinpoint exactly where tales of dragons originate. We could probably devote an entire YouTube channel to dragons, don't get any ideas, and have enough content to keep going for years. So for this dive into the world of dragons, I've decided to try and limit my focus mainly on that one question. Are the tales of dragons based on real animals that existed at one time? Excellent. That's the only question I'm curious about. Kind of the mythology and all of this stuff. I'm like, I'm nah, nah, just not really interested. Like, I, I, how was I? I? I stated in a previous video or something how I felt about mythology, and I was just like, it felt it feels just like old, boring, made up. Shit. I just don't really have any interest in mythology at all. Whenever we, I make a video about mythology, don't. It's not my idea. I'm just reading it <laughs> <laughs> because I'm creatively bankrupt. Your friend is quite a mercenary. A dragon in every culture. The first thing I'd like to address before we even continue onward is the notion that dragons across different cultures are the same. Now, even Simon, who has made his feelings towards fantasy very clear, but we enjoy your content anyway, should be able to tell you that this is simply not the case. However, it's an opinion I became aware of, mostly among people who don't know as much about mythology as they think they do. So let's start by clearing that up. Almost every culture has tales of dragons, that much is true, but the nature of dragons, their appearance, and the purpose of the legends can differ greatly between various cultures. 
The origin of dragons is lost to history, but generally it's accepted that the stories started, like so many things did, in ancient Greece. However, the dragon of ancient Greece was a different beast of the dragon of today. The word dragon is considered to be from the Greek drakon, which means serpents. The ancient Greeks had another word for snake, ophis, and while both words are used in Greek texts, the word draken is used in more religious or mythological contexts. The very first dragons were mostly considered to be large serpents. In Homer's Iliad, an eagle flying overhead drops a red dragon. To the Trojans, this was both a good and bad omen. They would win their upcoming battle against the Archeans, but they wouldn't return home without losses. While there is much to unpack in the Iliad, the important takeaway here is that the red dragon was carried by an eagle. This would imply that initially dragons were a lot smaller. Either that or ancient Greece had really big eagles. I mean, either that or it's like largely fictional. Right? Of course, the story of dragons evolves, and later Greek mythology has much larger, much more dangerous dragons, but uh, we all start out small. The evolution of dragons from mere serpents to the monsters we know today is truly fascinating, but I feel that is a story for another time. Perhaps when Simon branches out again and creates a channel all about mythology, not happening, it's too boring, I don't care how much people want to watch it, it's not interesting enough for me. Unlikely, I know, but a girl could dream. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's just not- I'm just not into it. I just don't like mythology. It's like fantasy, except- I- nothing except I don't like fantasy, I don't like mythology, I'm not into wizards and shit, all right? Although I did surprisingly quite enjoy those Harry Potter books when I was a kid. Harry Potter doesn't make you gay! When people picture dragons, the first image that comes to mind is a gigantic, fire-breathing reptile with wings. Oh yeah, they can fly! I totally forgot about that. That's also wildly unrealistic. Like, the breathing fire and flying, it's like, you see how big that is? Show me some other shit that's that big and can fly. I really can't think of anything. The small animals fly, not big animals. Like Drogon, one of Daenerys' dragons from Game of Thrones, and I have no idea if I'm pronouncing Daenerys right. I, I, I saw, look, 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 Game of Thrones, I don't like it. And people have told me, like, any time you're inside, like, oh, dude, no, 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 like, I didn't like fantasy at first, and I watched Game of Thrones, and now I love it. And I'm like, I watched the first two episodes. And I think I watched even the first episode twice, because it, I came back to it years later and was like, okay, let's give this another crack. I watched it with my wife, and she has the same opinion about fantasy as I do. And we were just like, no, 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 no. And I'm not going to watch, like, the whole first season. Like, when people are like, well, it really gets good in season three, not Game of Thrones, <coughs> not Game of Thrones, but like other shows. And it's like, what? So I'm going to watch two years worth of TV um, to get to where it gets good. It's why I really struggle with Star Trek Deep Space Nine. People are like, it gets good in the third season or fourth season or something. And it's like, yeah, but I don't want to not watch the first few seasons. And then I've tried getting into Deep Space Nine at least three or four times, and I've never succeeded just because the first few seasons are just, they just don't grab me enough. This image is based on the Western dragon. However, European dragon would probably be a better name, as it refers to dragons from Ireland to the Scandinavian countries. However, legends of dragons differ wildly between different countries, or even between different regions within the same country, so it becomes difficult to create a single picture of the Western dragon. European dragons came in different shapes and sizes, though they were mostly based on reptiles or snakes. There was the four-legged, sometimes two-legged, winged kind of dragon that breathed fire and could fly. On the other hand, there were also more serpentine dragons without wings that basically looked like a, li a really large snake. For the dragon experts in the audience, a two-legged dragon is called a wyvern and is usually smaller than a dragon, but for the purposes of this script, let's just stick to using the word dragon as an umbrella term instead of frustrating sign with a long list of various types of dragons. Yeah, as they're not even real, let's not worry about the different types, okay? Like, even when we're talking about different from birds or like animals and shit. It's like, and then there are the two different types and one of them is name in Latin. I'm just like, let's just call it, can we just call it bird? It's a bird. What is that? It's a bird. <laughs> That's enough. Why, why overcomplicate matters? One site I visited listed 51 different types of dragon, and while you and I find, may find that fascinating, dear dragon lover, our fantasy-deprived host may not. So, after a moment of silent mourning for all that he's missing out on in life, may your kids love Dungeons & Dragons. Let's continue. Alright, alright, alright. My kids can love whatever they want. I just don't like fantasy. I don't like dragons. I don't like mythology. Everyone's clicking off because I'm making a video about dragons and I hate all this bullshit. I mean... I, I, <laughs> I like shitting on it, which is why I like doing this show. But I just, and it's not like I haven't given it a try. I've read Lord of the Rings. I read The Hobbit. I had to read The Hobbit in school. It's boring. 
I saw the Lord of the Rings movie. I've seen Star Wars movie, two of them. The new one and one of the old ones. I just don't like it. I just don't like it and I've given it a shot. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Let's continue. My God. I've heard a rant like this before. Initially, dragons could be benevolent and helpful, even taking on the role of protector, but more often, they would be malevolent entities, creatures with evil supernatural powers. Dragons were often cast in the role of a guardian, either of their own treasure hoards or, especially in Greek mythology, said to guard something by the gods like Python, a dragon sent by Gaia, the earth goddess, to guard the Oracle of Delphi. Of course, then Apollo came along and killed it when he seized the shrine because the Greek gods clearly had too much much time on their hands, but I digress. In many early tales, dragons are cast as a villain, and their role is simply to be slain by a knight for the treasure that they guard, because what would a dragon need gold for anyway? Of course, not all dragon slayers were knights, and not all treasure was gold. In the story of Smok Wawelski, or the Wawel Dragon in Krakow, Poland, the hero was a simple shoemaker's apprentice who outwitted the dragon, terrorizing the town. The hero stuffed a lamb with sulfur. Of course, the greedy dragon ate the lamb, and when it stomach started burning due to all of that sulfur, it drank water until it exploded. Instead of gold, the king gave the shoemaker's apprentice his daughter's hand in marriage, though it's unclear from the story whether the princess was as thrilled with this outcome as her future husband. However, in some legends, dragons were more than mere beasts, and they were given human characteristics like intelligence and the ability to speak, sometimes on the same level of humans, often sharing human emotions and imparting wisdom and warnings. <laughs> I'm like, so the dragon in my mind, the fire-breathing, flying dragon standing up on two legs with little dinosaur-style T-Rex hands at the front, is like, that's one of the more realistic options for dragons. Because another option is, it also talks in the local language and is intelligent. It's, uh, it's not real. In the story of Sigurd and Fafnir, Sigurd is warned by the dragon that who sent Sigurd after the dragon in the first place was planning on killing him and keeping the dragon's treasure for himself instead of sharing it as promised. For the most part, though, European dragons were merely feral beasts with the sole purpose of offering bored knights some way of winning over a fair maiden and improving their bravery. So, dragons were essentially just plot devices because they're fictional. Once the Christians came along, the nature and role of dragon, dragons changed completely. To the people of the time, dragons weren't only real, they were evil. The representation of <laughs> Satan himself. Dragons guarding their treasure were depicted as lazy and greedy. Well, if they were so lazy, where'd they get all that treasure from? For those who know their deadly sins, that's too sloth and greed. Some scholars believe, why do all, this, why do all the deadly sins have to be the, the fun ones, like sloth and greed? That's just how it works. So like that's like sitting in front of the TV and eating McDonald's. Why is why are the deadly sins all, all like that sounds great? That honestly sounds really nice. Like why can't I have that? Like I work hard. I, I mean, look at me. I'm reading scripts in front of a camera. This is this is what I describe as hard. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to hell. Some scholars believe that the all-time favorite fire-breathing ability also has its roots in the medieval descriptions of the entrance to hell, literally the mouth of a monster complete with smoke and flame. Our ancestors really had a flair for the dramatic. Dragon slayer knights like St. George, the patron saint of England, became representative of the church. During his travels, our dragon slaying saints came across the town of Silene, which found itself in the clutches of a dragon. Oh no! In order to gain access, gain access to their only water source, the townsfolk had to sacrifice livestock to the dragon. However, once the livestock ran out, they started sacrificing their children. No parenting awards for you. <laughs> yeah, but in the past it was like, ah, children, what are they good for? Work in the fields? Probably dying in infancy? People were not as attached to their children in the past. Which now, as having kids, I'd be like, that seems insane. So George arrived just as the princess of the royal family was about to be sacrificed. He leapt to the defense of the innocent maiden, made the sign of the cross, and defeated the dragon. Out of gratitude of saving their town, the people immediately converted to Christianity. Knights defeating dragons became a symbol of good, or more specifically the church being victorious over evil, or more specifically Satan. Despite dragons being depicted as evil beasts and minions of Satan through most of the Middle Ages, they were also seen as symbols of nobility and bravery and were often used in heraldry and on flags. Oh my god, that's so true. All of those like, what is this? That's the town crest. That's my coat of arms. That's, I don't know, some bullshit shield thing with a painting on it. Often involving dragons. Doesn't the UK have dra- No, that's lions. There's like the three lions thing. I feel like there's also dragons somewhere. Maybe that's just St. George slaying that dragon. 
Like the red dragon on the flag of Wales and the dragons in the coat of arms for Iceland and the cities of London and Moscow, to name just a few, it appears that the true nature of the dragon has been eluding us for centuries. Eastern Dragons on the opposite side of the globe, on the shores of China, and living in the green mountains of Asia, a completely different creature was making an impression on mankind. We call them dragons, but a few articles I read suggested that this might be a mistranslation, since the eastern dragon, or long, is very different from what we in the West imagine as a dragon. Eastern dragons, also called oriental dragons, can be traced back as far as 2100 BCE. That's well before dragons started terrorizing the West. Chinese dragon is more than just a reptile. It's a composite creature with elements drawn from multiple existing animals. Unfortunately, I don't read Mandarin, so I had to use the English articles, and there are some discrepancies among them. But for the most part, Chinese dragons appear to consist of the head of a camel, what? The claws of an eagle, the soles of a tiger, the neck and body of a serpent, the belly of a clam? Could it get more absurd? I'm like, it starts absurd, and then it's like, yeah, yeah, and the part of them's clam. Like, as in shellfish? Like, what the fuck? The scales of a carp, the ears of an ox, the horns of a deer, and the eyes of a devil. Unlike western dragons, the eastern dragons are mostly serpents without wings. However, despite not having wings, they are still majestic flyers. They often sport manes or dorsal fins and come in a variety of shapes, colors, and sizes, though red and gold is the most common. Look, okay, I know I shat all over the western dragons for not being real, but holy shit, Chinese dragons. Could it be more made up? If I was made, if I, if someone was like, make something impossible, make something that could never exist, I'd be like, well, we'll give it the head of a camel, the body of a clam, and it's uh, also gold. It's golden. It's like, <laughs> all right, guys. One article I read describes the Oriental dragons as the angels of the East. They are considered beautiful and friendly, benevolent. Oh, and it can also fucking fly. Benevolent, spiritual entities, sources of great wisdom and guides. These dragons also have magical or supernatural powers and are often associated with wells, rain, and rivers. They not only guide the living, they also transport humans to the celestial realm after they die. Where dragons in the West were feared and hunted, dragons in the East were beloved and worshipped with shrines built in their honor. Dragons are also sometimes capable of speech, and some are even able to speak all the languages spoken by man. The Eastern Dragon also has a lifespan of hundreds or even thousands of years, and since they weren't being hunted by bored knights or the church looking to defeat Satan, I'm guessing they had a far better chance of actually living that long. In Chinese mythology, the dragon is considered a sign of nobility, and only the emperor was allowed to wear robes decorated with images of a dragon. While the Chinese, those are going to be extremely complicated to draw based on the uh, physical makeup of the dragon with its camel head and its clam body it's elaborate if someone was like create some talk about describe something that's hard to draw that's what i would describe while chinese people consider themselves to be descendants of dragons some emperors starting with the first emperor of the han dynasty lu bang claimed to be a direct descendant of dragons in this case he was the result of his mother's desire divine meeting with a dragon wait so you're saying like literally a clam camel headed golden flying dragon fucked your mum are you sure that's something you want to be bragging about, mate? That's the sort of shit you tell another kid at school, and he'd cry. While these two types are the dragons that most of us are familiar with, I was not familiar with those Chinese dragons. Like, I feel like I've seen Chinese dragons drawn, you know, like, the gold on red is what's coming into my mind, like, silk screen printed or whatever. But, like, this clam, camel-headed, devil-eyed flying thing? I'm not, no, that is new to me. That is all new. Dragons also appear in other cultures as well. Quetzalcoatl. The me a Mesoamerican god of wind, air, and learning is described as a feathered serpent. That doesn't sound too unrealistic. In a minute, they'll be like, and it flies and has the body of a clam. <laughs> in Egypt, the dragon Apep fought the sun god Ra, and among the Australian Aboriginal peoples, the rainbow serpents are considered to be descendants of living creatures in the Milky Way galaxy and associated with rain, rivers, waterholes, and of course, rainbows. And these are just a few. I even discovered some dragons in South Africa, one of the most notable being the Nana Bolili, a water-dwelling dragon slayed by our own legendary dragon slayer, Princess Takenia. So dragons really are everywhere. Um, Ilza is from South Africa. That's why, because not me, obviously. That's the how it with the thing. Where did the stories originate? So to get back to why we're all here, were dragons real? I often hear people say that all legends have a kernel of truth to them, and who knows? Maybe they're right. After all, after years of presumably diligent studies, scholars still can't tell us where and when the stories of dragons started. However, there are a number of theories doing the rounds, but I've decided to focus on the four most popular theories.
Humans and dinosaurs coexisted. I'll be honest, the idea of humans and dinosaurs sharing a planet deeply appeals to the writer in me. I'm imagining a world where my ancestors had tiny dinosaurs for pets and went shopping at the local caves and watering holes riding the latest model of dinosaur, perhaps with a pair of woolly dice or a rosary tied to a convenient horn or scale for those who wanted to be really chic. Sadly, despite what the Flintstones might have you believe, this was uh, unlikely. I'm going to say it's completely factually inaccurate. The argument about whether humans and dinosaurs coexisted is essentially an argument between the creationists and the evolutionists. Let the debate begin about who's on the list, who's not on the list. Oh yeah, because of course the creationists have to believe that everything existed at the same time because history's so short, which, uh, I mean, good lord. It, could it be more obviously bullshit? And I get that, you know, if you're a bit nuts, you have to believe that everything in the Bible is the literal truth, which we've brought up a few times, because I just didn't believe it. I was like, no, no, no. The Bible is allegory, and stories, and honestly, like, plenty of valuable and useful moral lessons. But it's not literal. Like, most of it isn't literal, and the people writing it weren't being literal. And there are very religious people who believe that no, it is literal, and everything in the Bible literally happens. And that all of history is what? 6,000 years old? 8,000 years old? Something like that? Which is obviously demonstrably false. And yet here we are, in 2022, with people believing this still. Oh my god, it's like, how much crack do you have to smoke to believe in that? Now when I was a wee lass, a kindly church elder informed me the dinosaurs were, in fact, mythological and never really existed. So, in a way, I suppose at least one branch of the church has come a long way. <laughs> if you believe them unholy evolutionist non-avian dinosaurs died out around 65 million years ago, give or take a few million years. Dinosaurs graced our planet for roughly 186 million years during the Meso Mesozoic Age, generally divided into Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. The very first human ancestors only made their appearance around 5.8 to 4. 4 million years ago, so there is a 60 million year gap between non-avian dinosaurs and humans. In fact, you are closer to T-Rex today than the Stegosaurus was back in the time of the dinosaurs, which is just mind-blowing. But completely false, because as we all know, the Earth is only 8,000 years old. Archaeologists and paleontologists have been digging up bones for many years, and dinosaur bones and the skeletons of our human ancestors have never been found in the same layers of rock. So it's safe to say that the two of them never met face to face. Of course, this is only true of non-avian dinosaurs. Birds, interesting balls of rage and feathers that they are, are direct descendants from a group of theropod dinosaurs that's the bipedal carnivorous kind like the T-Rex, but we're talking about the smaller, in some cases feathered, theropods. Of course, this means Sylvester has been chasing a dinosaur, not merely a canary, which does put that timeless battle into a little bit more perspective. Oh. Oh, like uh, Looney Tunes, right? Ah, look at me getting a reference, sort of, halfway. The genus Pterosauria, of which the pterodactyl is probably the best known example, were flying reptiles and they died out at the end of the Cretaceous period, along with the other dinosaurs. To simplify that, even though your budgie is a dinosaur, our human ancestors never encountered large flying reptiles. No, by <laughs> dozens of millions of years. And yeah, like, there are big birds. But pterodactyls were pretty big, right? I feel like I've seen, like, skeletons of those, or not skeletons, like fossils of pterodactyls. They were large. Are the birds as large as that today? But dragons, they're much bigger. They're much bigger. Like, they're not, because they're not real, but you know what I mean. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I do know that evolution is a long process and not something that happens overnight. So, if you want to get really technical about it, mammals did coexist with dinosaurs, but they were very small and there just weren't that many of them. When the dinosaurs went extinct, the mammals didn't all follow suit and were able to flourish once the big lizards, yes, I know they weren't all lizards, it's called poetic license, had gone the way of, well, the dinosaur. Among these mammals were a primate species known as the Purgur pur purgatorius. Not much is known about this mouse-sized creature other than that it had teeth, ankles, climbed trees, and lived about 65 million years ago. God, I'm really glad we knew it had ankles. <laughs> it's important detail, scientist. It's like the ancient mouse had ankles. Hmm. Fascinating. 
Now, to be clear, these primates may, in a sense, be considered the earliest ancestors of primates that eventually evolved into the charming, fantasy-loving Homo sapiens of today, but at the time, they were animals climbing trees, possibly eating fruit, and doing whatever purgatorius did in those days. They definitely weren't telling stories about dragons to their purgatorious babies around campfires while Dave was off painting some cave walls. According to creationists, however, the Earth is not billions of years old. In fact, it's only around 6,000 to 10,000 years old. For those who might be a bit unclear on this, creationism is the belief that the Earth was created in a, by a single deity that is beyond human understanding. The deity is still involved in its creation, and without the deity's attention, this creation would cease to exist. As with all things involving humans, there are some disagreements. For, for example, some creationists believe that a day back when the Earth was created in seven days was exactly 24 hours, while others conceded that a day might be just a bit longer. Unless they're believing it's going to be several millions of years longer, then, uh, well, they're, they're mistaken, aren't they? They also argue that radiometric dating is inaccurate because it's based on assumptions and interpretations, which I suppose math and science technically are, but, well, they're well-researched assumptions and interpretations. <laughs> Instead, they look to the Bible, and based on the chronology of the Bible, the Earth can't be billions of years old. Now, according to scripture, on day five, God created great sea creatures and flying creatures, which some creationists consider to include dinosaurs such as Pleosaurus, a sea creature, pterodactyl, and pterodactyl flying creatures. On day six, he created land animals that would have included land dinosaurs, and finally, on day seven, he created man. Now, considering that the number of animal species that have existed all through time, I'm guessing the planet must have been a bit crowded. <laughs> Just one of the many reasons why creationism is absolutely fucking bonkers. Creationists mainly use the Bible to prove their theory. But before we get to scripture, we do need to pause and consider another source that could possibly indicate that humans and dinosaurs coexisted in the past. Ancient art. There are many... What, what is... What, 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 no! No, 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 that's like me drawing a picture of a dinosaur and drawing a picture of a little stick man and being like, and look! <laughs> Photorealistic! There are many examples of animals that bear a close resemblance to dinosaurs showing up in ancient cave drawings, carvings on pottery, and even small figurines. Probably one of the most popular is the stegosaurus on the walls of the Tabrom Temple near Angkor Wat in Cambodia, built in the 12th century. I've actually been there. Now, even I have to admit that this carving does look a lot like a stegosaurus, it even has the arranged plates on its back. Scholars feel that the carving is more likely a rhino with some artistic embellishments or even a hoax. The site has been popular with movie crews for many years, so some scholars are of the opinion that the carving is a later addition. You've got to be a real dickhead to go to like some massively important historical site and be like, I'm gonna carve a stegosaurus onto the wall. That's like that's some terrible shit. Some men just want to watch the world burn. That feels like a bit of a stretch to me, but I'll come back to this Stegosaurus a little bit later. There are more examples of supposed dinosaurs in ancient art. Some of it has been explained by scientists as images of other animals that have been misinterpreted, like the supposed dinosaur carvings on the Kachina Bridge in Utah by the Anasazi people, or simply vandalism by whelming amateurs who used chalk to outline what they perceived to be dinosaurs, which is what happened to the cave painting in the Black Dragon Canyon, also in Utah. Others haven't really been fully explained at all, like the Sirush of the Ishtar Gate created in around 600 BCE, but we'll get back to this one too. For now, let us get back to the creationists' favorite source to prove their theory, the Bible. You can't prove this... Mm. So much wrong with this sentence. For not the sentence being written, just the concept there of like proving shit with the Bible. The Bible isn't proven to be real, for one. Now, the Bible is not entirely a piece of fiction. That is true. That is definitely true. In fact, I was just making a video the other day about stuff that in the real world has proven things in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the Bible is real. It's like King's Cross Station is a real place. Platform 9 and 3 quarters is not. One does not mean that the... Well, just because one thing is fact doesn't mean the rest of it is fact. Of course. Obviously. I'd have to have a really small brain to think otherwise. Or a big brain, but that is thoroughly brainwashed. We'll give Simon five minutes. <laughs> okay, now that Simon's done disagreeing with me, hear me out. No, the Bible is plenty of, like, historical Jesus, probably a real person. 
There's lots of shit in the Bible that's totally hist historic. The Bible was written by people, and like all legends and mythology, was used to explain things that people at the time couldn't always make sense of. That is why there are instances in the Bible that refer to actual historical events that occurred and real people that lived and ruled at the time. As a student of literature, I can confidently say there is much we can learn from ancient texts about what people believed and how they lived. However, this doesn't mean that I consider the Bible to be 100% scientifically accurate. And now that we're all going to hell, Let's continue. Good news, Ilsa. Fortunately, hell isn't real, so relax. The Bible makes several references to dragons, notably the Leviathan and the dragon in the book of Revelations. In the book of Job, I believe it's pronounced Job, right? In the book of Job, a behemoth is described as a creature that eats grass like an ox, moves its tail like a cedar, and with bones like beams of bronze. Apparently, no, apparently to those in the know, this describes a sauropod, like a brachiosaurus, which proves that humans and dinosaurs roamed the earth together, and what we call dragons were actually dinosaurs. Now, I went and read the detailed description of the behemoth, but to be honest, to me it sounds more like a mammoth, a creature, ancient man, certainly coexisted with, or perhaps even a bison. <laughs> well, that's the boring answer, Ilza. However, I'm one of them unholy evolutionists, so don't take my word for it and feel free to read it yourself. Of course, I don't like to generalize, as I do have some friends who are Christian, so please know that not all Christians believe this. To many, the dragon is merely a symbol of Satan, and they believe that Christ will defeat it in the end time. Some of the other Abrahamic religions also mention dragons, but once again, not all believers are of the opinion that dragons were ever real. Religion and faith of any kind relies heavily on symbolism and, well, faith. So let's conclude this section by saying that some creationists believe that dragons were dinosaurs, but not all believers of any faith are creationists. Some of them are scientists and find the whole thing ridiculous. And now, uh, let's get back to those dragons. Yes, entirely. The, I believe, like, creationism is a small subset of Christians. Like, I know plenty of Christians. Like, plenty. Do they believe in creationists? Do they believe the Earth is 8,000 years? Of course fucking not, because they're not stupid. And they're not that brainwashed. Do they believe in... Uh, magical Jesus being the son of God and magical God? Yes, certainly. I, everything's like a scale and people believe different things. Like, I'm not against the idea of God. Like, I believe. I don't know. I think there, there, there could well be a higher power. Do I believe it is the Christian God, the Abrahamic God, um, any of the other religions? No, I don't think so at all. Do I believe there could be a God that exists? Yeah. Sure, I could believe in that. Some like higher power that we don't understand. Sure. I just don't think it's ever going to be explained by church or temple or whatever. It's going to be explained by science. Maybe. Probably not. Now let's get back to them dragons. Of course, there are some who believe that not only did humans and dinosaurs once coexist, we still do. And I'm not talking about birds. Wait, <laughs> I don't believe there are dinosaurs still around. <laughs> So we're back with the crack smokers. This is known as the Neo Dinosaur Theory. I have never heard of this. Please, no. Please don't tell me this is real. Oh, God. Some cryptozoologists. Oh, God. No, not cryptozoology. Uh, of the belief that actual dinosaurs still exist today, the Loch Ness Monster, which we all know is real, of course, was not considered to be a plesiosaurus, that somehow managed to survive in the loch for millions of years. Millions of, millions of years. You know how long that is? It's really long. Nessie is not the only plesiosaurus, though. Residents of the Congo believe that the Mokela Mamembe, another neo-dinosaurian cryptid, is alive and well in the Congo Basin. And if these animals are around today, then surely they were around in the time of our ancestors, probably in larger numbers. Now, much as I wish this were true, the fact is that for a species to survive, it needs a sustainable breeding colony. A breeding colony of dinosaurs would have been documented, and before you say it, tales of fire-breathing lizards hoarding treasure and dispensing advice doesn't count. If our ancestors could document elephants and giraffes without adding the ability to spit fire and hold long conversations, I'm sure they would have managed the same with a breeding colony of dinosaurs. Yes, indeed. Because while the past was the worst, we, we know we were always fairly competent at stuff. Like, well, we gave it our best shot. We weren't constantly making shit up. A combination of predators. Every child hears stories about certain dangers to avoid. These stories and dangers change with the times. When I was a child, I was told horror stories by teachers and friends about what happens to kids who accept candy or get into cars with strangers. Yeah, don't do either of those things. 
I'll still be like, make it. Do not get in a stranger's car. Do not take candy from the weird man on the street. Just don't. You're probably going to be fine. No, I scratch that. Don't get into stranger's cars. Don't get into stranger's cars. You're going to end up murdered. Okay? <laughs> my kid will be like, Dad, what's murder? That's where your life ends. And there's just an endless black void of nothingness. And then they'll be terrified. And I'll be like, and my wife will be like, why did you say that? And I'll be like, to teach an important lesson. <laughs> I sometimes, I, I definitely feel like I'm the dad <laughs> with my kids sometimes. Because like sometimes my wife will be like, why did you do that? And I'm like, because you have to. Like, what was it? She didn't eat her dinner the other day. And she's like, can I have some chocolate? And my wife goes to get the chocolate. I'm like, what are you doing? And she, she's like, well, she wants some chocolate. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> this is not sending the right right message. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, you're right. And then my kid thinks I'm the bad guy because I stopped the chocolates. But I guess I am the bad guy. But also I'm the one who's like, this is... This is good, right? You shouldn't just give your kids chocolate. I haven't actually looked this up in any parenting manual, but it seems like fairly common sense. If your child doesn't eat their dinner, they don't get rewarded with chocolate afterwards. I feel like that's that's decent parenting. And yeah, but I still end up looking like the bad dude. <laughs> it's like, dad's mean. Dad doesn't let me have chocolate when I don't eat my pasta. Jesus, what are we talking about? I'm sorry. Tangent's over. However, my nieces today will probably be told horror stories about the dangers hiding in online and online chat rooms and the importance of always making sure your friends know where you are if you're going to meet a stranger that you met online. How about, how about this? Don't go meeting strangers that you meet online unless you're an adult and you're using one of those apps. All right, then you can make big adult decisions. When you're a kid, until you're an adult, no meeting people that you met online. Okay? Unless it's part of some, like, blanket rule no actually change my mind <laughs> be like but dad they're my friends and we all have this thing we like and we want to go to this convention no <laughs> no you may not go and while the monsters today are lurking online or were part of the stranger danger craze back when our ancestors were starting their paths to evolution these monsters were dangerous predators of the animal kingdom kind and of course mythical monsters like dragons while this doesn't hold true for all dragons most dragons show characteristics related to big cats birds of prey and snakes or if you're in the east clams which I still am getting over. It's a big surprise even for me. According to anthropologist David E. Jones, dragons essentially encapsulate all the predators our ancestors feared into one neat little package, and this fear was passed from one generation to the next. A good example would be a fear of snakes, which is one of the most common phobias in the world, even among people who don't interact with snakes that much. An interesting study was done on macaques to see if there is a genetic fear of snakes. The macaques raised in captivity initially didn't show any reaction to a rubber snake. However, after seeing a video Video of other macaques screaming at a snake, their attitude completely changed and they developed an almost immediate fear of snakes, even the rubber ones. This suggests that there is an inherent fear of snakes that was activated when the macaques saw other macaques reacting to a snake. Today, more people have a phobia of snakes than, say, motor vehicles or guns, though your chances of facing an armed criminal or being in a car accident is much higher than being bitten by a snake, especially if you live in a city. Wow, I did. even if you live in like, Australia? Isn't Australia full of snakes? Like, when I think of Australia, most people most people i fear i feel have snakes in their homes just loose or in the garden or at work or in their car because it's australia it's scary however it appears that millions of years of evolutionary bias towards serpents is hard to overcome of course fewer people have a phobia of big cats or birds of prey but large predators like big cats and wolves and large raptors would most certainly have been a threat to our ancestors who were smaller in stature than we are today um i don't think that me being like tall or bigger than my ancestors is going to make me much more of uh much much less vulnerable when i'm attacked by a fucking tiger because it's a tiger it's gonna destroy me whether i'm five foot or six foot it's a tiger some of the largest birds of prey around these days like harpy like the harpy eagle or the philippine eagle will hunt small animals like monkeys and possums and even small deer so early homo sapien children would have been fair game every child has heard the words don't play in insert name of dangerous place because insert name of local monster will get you i'm fairly certain this 
is a trend that began when the first child decided to go play in the local tar pit and their parents grunted a warning about the local saber-toothed tiger snacking on their bones. Dragons very rarely live in comfortable homes with extra security. Instead, they prefer living in dark underground caves, marshes, and even underwater in the case of water dragons. Yeah, I'd be like... <laughs> Dad, why can't I go to the park? Um, because I, I, I'm thinking in my mind, because I just want to stay home today. Ah, uh, there are dragons at the park, and dragons are dangerous. <laughs> okay, Dad, thanks for looking after me. These are all places that would have been dangerous for our ancestors. Bears and other predators often live or sleep in caves. Large snakes like pythons prefer marshlands, and if you're not a strong swimmer, falling into a deep or fast-flowing river means you will drown or perhaps become a snack to creatures like crocodiles and, once again, pythons that live in or around waterholes. Stories of monsters have been used as warnings for centuries, and I don't think it's much of a stretch to believe that some fears, like a fear of snakes or large predators, is to some degree programmed into our DNA from when our ancestors still face these dangers every day. And, as humans are prone to do, fears become tales in which heroes defeat the dangerous dragons that the storytellers themselves couldn't slay just yet. Dinosaurs again. You probably thought we were done with dinosaurs, right? I did. I did. Back to the old dinosaurs. Okay. This is a long episode. Like a, like a dragon. Well, I say dinosaurs, but that's not exactly accurate. Rather, I should say dinosaur bones. While paleontology only became an accepted branch of science in the 1800s, humans have been digging up bones for thousands of years, and to our medieval ancestors, dragons were not the creatures of myth and legends. They were living, breathing animals, and they had the bones to prove it. Yeah, of course, like you'd see one of those like dinosaur bones and be like, oh my god, what the hell is this? Did they think it was the bones of like giant ancient people once upon a time before we were like, nah, it's not this. The Earth is really old, and there were all sorts of creatures around before us, which, when first discovered, is quite mind-blowing, right? For a moment, imagine that you are an ancient Greek lad wandering across the countryside, or a simple medieval farmer who can't properly read or write, just hoeing your land, planting potatoes and cabbage, and not bothering anybody. One day, while exploring some local hills on your travels, or while digging up a new field because you wish to expand into carrots, you come across some very large bones, nothing like any animal you've ever seen. What a man with no education to make of this? Well, obviously, you've just uncovered a dragon. To us, this may seem like a silly conclusion to jump to, but the truth is, back then, people simply had no idea what exactly they were looking at. A lot of the research to connect dinosaur fossils with dragons was done by Adrian Mayer, a folklorist and historian of ancient science who became a self-taught expert in the relatively new field of geomythology. That's like cryptozoology. It's like two things that shouldn't be mixed together, but somehow are. I never heard of this either, but it turns out that geomythology is when geology and mythology come together. Mythology was often used to explain geological processes like volcanic eruptions that people at the time couldn't explain in any other way. By studying both the geology and mythology of an area, you can learn much of what happened in that particular place and time with regards to natural processes. Maya spent two decades collecting and comparing ancient paleonto paleo paleontological good lord, that's a word, reports with ancient literature to prove her hypothesis that tales of ancient creatures like dragons and griffins had some foundation in fossils found in the areas the stories originated. And that sounds completely legit. Can you imagine reading all those stories and being like, this exists in our history, like in mythology, and then just seeming to discover the bones that prove it? You'll be like, this is locked down. This is legit. And then someone, proper scientist in the future, is going to come, come along and ruin everything for you and be like, nah, it's dinosaurs. And those aren't bones. They're, I mean, they are bones. They were once bones. They're now fossils. They're millions of years old. They're way, way older, like incomprehensibly older than any of those books and stories that you've heard. Like literally an order of magnitude. Several orders of magnitude long older. A good example would be the myth of the Griffins, as told by Herodotus, either the first historian or a storyteller of note in around 400 BCE. According to Herodotus, Griffins were a type of creatures that guarded rich gold deposits in the mountains of Scythia against their neighbors, the Arimaspians, a mythical race of one-eyed men who constantly tried to steal their gold. Sounds like pure fiction. Right? Well, as it turns out, the Gobi Desert, where the Scythian people dug for gold, had protoceratops fossils aplenty. The protoceratops is considered a predecessor to the triceratops, though it was much smaller. If you look at the skull, it looks like the animal had a beak, much like a bird. It also had a tail and four legs, so obviously it couldn't be a bird, so it became some sort of half-bird. What this story illustrates is that not only did our ancestors 
ancestors come across fossils, like people all through history, they also made sense of fossils in the only way they could. In this instance, the fossils became a griffin. This also brings us back to the Stegosaurus on the temple in Cambodia that we mentioned, and perhaps even the Shurush of the Ishtar Gate commissioned by King Nebuchadnezzar. Because the other animals depicted in the carvings on the temple and in the artwork on the gate were real animals, some folk use this as proof that the Sirush and the Stegosaurus were also based on living animals the artists encountered. However, ancient peoples discovering dinosaur bones or even whale bones could have assumed that the bones belonged to real living animals they simply hadn't seen yet. There are plenty of creatures living in the desert depths of the ocean that we haven't seen yet. It doesn't mean they don't exist. I don't think we can fault our ancestors for believing the same thing and using their imagination to fill in the blanks. Certainly not. I mean, it, if if that was what the stories of these things and now we have the bones, like I said previously, be like, yeah, it looks legit. Totally, totally get it. A very popular tale of dinosaur fossils being classified as dragons comes from ancient China. Fossils are plentiful in China, and in around 350 CE, Chinese scholar Qu Chang described dragon bones as being found in what is today Sichuan province in China. There's also tales of dragon bones being discovered during the construction of a canal in 120 BCE. Dragon bones are a staple in Chinese medicine, and from my research, it looks like you can cure just about anything with the application of powdered dragon bones, so this is quite a valuable commodity even today it's, it's sad that we say even today <laughs> like people are grinding up like rhinoceros or all that shit so they get a boner like come on it's obviously nonsense there are real drugs for this and stop grinding up dead animals or killing animals to grind them up or removing their horns or grinding up fossils it's weird guys stop it it's nonsense However, as some paleontologists have pointed out, while the Sichuan province is renowned for its fossil beds, without proper descriptions, which is sadly lacking in most accounts, we can't say for sure whether the dragon bones found were, in fact, dinosaur bones. Of course, folks living in the medieval ages and well into the 1600s and even 1700s didn't have to use their imagination all that much. The Bible told them dragons were real, and the bones simply reinforced what they already knew to be the truth. In fact, in 1672, a group of German scholars scholars reported that a cave had been found in the Carpathians in Transylvania containing dragon bones. But what if you were an ancient human living in a region bereft of dinosaurs? That's not a problem since dinosaur fossils were not the only bones considered to be those of a dragon. Any prehistoric animal that had gone extinct could be considered a dragon, as is the case with the dragon of Klagenfurt. According to the tale, long ago, as the Never seems to be an exact date in these things. In the, march in the marshes of a town near Klagenfurt in Austria, the townsfolk were terrorized by a serpent-like dragon. You know why there's no date on this stuff? Because it never happened. It just never happened. And if it did, it's just like told through allegory and tales and it becomes all twisted until someone finally writes it down. The dragon wasn't picky and would eat anything that came its way, be it people or livestock. Finally, a knight was found to slay the dragon, since slaying a to dragons is right at the top of any self-respecting knight's resume. As the heroes want to do, the knight prevailed, the dragon was slain, and its skull was placed in the town hall to commemorate the event. In 1582, the skull was used as an, by an artist to model a sculpture of the notorious dragon, which still stands in the city today. In the 1800s, zoologists realized that the skull was actually that of an Ice Age woolly rhinoceros, not a dragon, but like dinosaurs, it was an unfamiliar animal for the folks who didn't know any better, so obviously it was the skull of a dragon. Dragons were, in fact, real. Imagine for a second, dear listener, you are a future human, living on a spaceship, orbiting the third moon of a planet you can't quite pronounce. You are surrounded by aliens of all shapes and sizes, and Earth is but a distant memory. The only Earth animals that survived the destruction of the planet were dogs, because humans loaded them onto spaceships when they left, fleas because they were on the dogs, and cats because they were originally from Mars anyway. Your new bunkmate, an odd fellow perhaps, but harmless, has discovered a picture book hidden in a derelict spaceship you're salvaging, and excitedly starts telling you all about giraffes. Animals with impossibly long necks spotted from top to bottom and two small horns on their heads. And that's without creative embellishments. If you add a little creativity, the animal might have red eyes, sharp teeth, and spit acid. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little skeptical. However, giraffes are very real, and they're not the only odd animals out there. Imagine trying to describe a platypus to someone who's never even heard of one. When platypuses were first discovered, didn't people think that they were fake because they're like they have a bill, but they're also like a mammal. <laughs> Or are they a mammal? They don't they don't platypuses lay fucking eggs? What's up with platypus? Historical accounts of dragons are plentiful. Pliny the Elder in his Natural Histories describes dragons in detail. However, according to 
Now, according to good old Pliny, dragons came from Africa and India and were the natural enemies of elephants, another creature he seemed quite enamored with. And he devotes a whole chapter on the medicinal properties of the different parts of a dragon. While Pliny was considered a very learned man of his time, he also wrote extensively about mermaids, so I tend to take whatever he said with a pinch of salt. Yeah, historians and guys back in the day, it's like... They, they, their, their allowance for embellishment was a lot higher than historians today. When it's like, needs to be fact, chaps. Scholars today are of the opinion that he was writing about very large snakes that are mostly extinct or at the least very rare. Pliny was not the only naturalist in antiquity to mention dragons. Cicero describes flying serpents from the Libyan desert and. Atmianus Marcellius, a Roman soldier and historian, because even back then people needed multiple jobs, described winged armies of snakes from Arabia in around 380 BCE. Since the origin of the word dragon is in ancient Greek, perhaps dragons in ancient Greece were very real, only instead of the fire-breathing monsters we imagine, they were merely large, sometimes flying snakes. Flying snakes does seem a bit of an impossibility though, doesn't it? Because I mean, you could have some sort of weird long animal, but it would have to have some way of flying, like wings. Like a snake isn't going to suddenly just be able to hover. Moving on to the medieval ages, dragons appear in literature and art quite often. However, if you look at medieval paintings of dragons, you'll find something interesting. Medieval dragons were not that big. Some were the size of a horse, but some were even smaller, closer to that of a dog. They're distinctly lizard-like, usually with wings. Europe may not have had quite the variety of really large lizards that you'd find in the rest of the world, but as early as ancient Greece, people have traveled to other parts of the world, including North Africa and Egypt, home to the Nar Monitor, a lizard that can reach anything from 120 centimeters to 220, it's 47 feet, and the Nar Crocodile, but we'll get back to crocodiles in a minute. We also know that the first European arrived in Indonesia, home to the Komodo dragon in 1512. The average Komodo dragon can weigh between 70 and 80 kilos, that's 150 to 170 pounds, and reach up to 3 meters, that's 10 feet. That's not a lizard that I would want to tangle with. The first Europeans arrived in Australia, the country of all things that want to kill you, as I mentioned earlier. There are snakes everywhere, apparently never been there, in 1606, and Australia has quite a collection of lizards. It's entirely possible that there was a large lizard, perhaps even the size of a dog, in Europe that we just haven't discovered yet. We're discovering amazing new things about our planet and its history all the time. However, it's also, and perhaps more possible, that the dragon of medieval Europe was a combination of strange lizards discovered in far-off lands, all combined to create a single creature. Many scholars believe that tales of dragons might have been based on reptiles like the Nile crocodile that swam across the Mediterranean and ended up in Italy or Greece. To me, crocodiles seem to be the most likely culprits. As scary as the thought might be, a study has found that crocodiles from Africa could cross the Mediterranean. Even today, saltwater crocodiles could travel in the ocean using water currents, as they're not excellent swimmers. That's kind of terrifying. <laughs> Crocodile, stay away! I don't want you here! One crocodile travelled 590 kilometers. That's around 940 miles. No, it's not. <laughs> that must be there around. 940 km kilometers is 590 miles. In the open sea, maybe. About that. Something like that. In fact, even freshwater crocodiles can survive in the ocean. Nile crocodiles can be found in Madagascar, and some have been found as far north as Syria. While crocodiles mostly stay flat on their bellies, even when they move around, they can lift themselves off the ground. Fossils of giant crocodiles measuring up to 8 meters. That's 26 feet. That's fucking terrifying. Imagine 8 meter crocodile? What the fuck, man? Get that out of here have been found to have coexisted with early man, quite possibly snacking on our ancestors. Good lord. Eight. And we were small back in the day. I'm like, eight meters is already well over four times my size. Uh, that is massive! I can't get over the fact there were eight meter crocodiles. <laughs> Considering the average length of a saltwater crocodile, the largest species of crocodile alive today is around 4.5 meters or 14 feet, we're talking about a pretty big lizard. Even 4 meters is big. 8 meters is wild. Venetian explorer Marco Polo gave an account of dragons after his extensive travels through the Far East. He described serpents around 50 feet long, that's around 15 meters, with a girth of 100 inches, that's 250 centimeters! These are enormous creatures! The creatures had two short legs towards the front with three claws on each. They had large eyes, jaws big enough to swallow a man, and sharp teeth. Of course, there were similar. Of course, there were smaller specimens that the locals hunted and killed. They did not hunt those big boys. 
Although, I mean, humans are really smart. That's our thing. Like, we could... If someone was like, Simon, do you fancy taking out, like, a, a 20 meter long uh, lizard? I'd be like, well, no. Firstly. And then, well, what sort of weapons are available to me? And tactics. Because if you just made it, like, I could just have my choice of weapons and, like, defensive capabilities, then I'd be like, well, let's get something that the crocodile really likes. Like, little sheep or something. Lambs. We'll put those around. Then we'll get a giant steel box with a big glass window that is bulletproof. Let's just make it three bulletproof layers of glass and a little hole out of which I will point a fuck-off massive shotgun. Then I'll be like, sure, I'll take out a big lizard. Because humans are smart. That's what we do. The creatures were nocturnal, hidden caves during the day, and preserved water sources such as lakes and rivers, especially after killing prey. Their bodies left deep impressions behind, like a heavy beam that has been drawn along the sand. Either Marco Polo is describing an animal not yet discovered, or more likely he's describing an Asian crocodile or some ancestor to the Asian crocodile. I've mentioned the possibility of animals not yet known to science in both medieval Europe and in Marco Polo's descriptions of serpents in Asia. While the idea of it might seem a bit far-fetched, new discoveries are made all the time. As recently as 2022, two giant dwarf crocodiles, not two words I usually expect to see together, were identified to have lived in what is today considered Kenya, and a new species of abelisaurid, the Gymacera ocoi, was found in Argentina in 2022. No, I don't know how to pronounce that either. <laughs> I'm just doing my best guess. But I do know there was a theropod dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous period, and it's a very recent discovery in the world of paleontology. So, it is plausible that there was once a large crocodile or crocodile-like creature with longer legs that could lift itself higher off the ground. It is even possible that dragon bones are still waiting to be discovered, or perhaps that dragon fossils have been uncovered but have been classified as something else entirely. So I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, like, some sort of dragon-like creature, of course, could have existed. And, I, I mean, just because it hasn't been discovered yet doesn't mean it won't be discovered. Of course. Completely believable. Flying dragons that bre breathe fire? Please. Are flying dragons impossible? It looks like we're addressing that right now. So, we know that flying, fire-breathing dragons don't exist, but I couldn't help wondering, is something like that possible in nature? Turns out I'm not the only one wondering, and some scientists have a little too much time on their hands because according to science, it's entirely possible. Flying dragons. I don't believe... Fire-breathing. Flying. How? I mean, you could have a flying dinosaur, like a pterodactyl, so big flying things do exist. So I guess technically, yes, evolution could go that way at some point, and then also breathe fire? Come on. And also, dragons have the tiny wings, as they're depicted, like, in my mind. They've got those little tiny wings on the back. That's not going to work. The first consideration would simply be size. The larger a creature is, the less likely it is to get airborne. The largest bird in the world, the ostrich, can't fly at all. However, the largest known flying animal in fossil record was the late Cretaceous pterosaur Oh my god, Quetzalcoatlus northropi, which coincidentally is not a bird. It had a wingspan of 11 meters, that's 36 weight, feet, and it weighed 200 to 250 kilograms! That's around 440 to 550 pounds! That's mental! That would make it bigger than a lion or a tiger, so it wouldn't have been able to make off with livestock or even early man. No shit, because it's massive! Now, if you're of the belief that only birds, bats, and bugs can fly, you're in for a surprise. There are a number of lizards, like the Draco lizard from Southeast Asia, that prove you don't need wings to fly. The Draco lizard could flatten its body and use wing-like flaps to glide about 60 meters. That's 190 feet. That's pretty impressive. Luckily, these lizards are fairly small and only eat insects, so you, your granny, and your pet goat are all safe. Of course, lizards are not the only ones who can glide. Some snakes, known as flying snakes, can also glide as far as the length of a soccer field because, you know, we didn't have enough to worry about already, so we can now add flying snakes to the list. What? How have I never heard of this flying snake that can... I, I know snakes, like, jump from tree to tree and shit, but it can glide the length of a soccer field? Why it... Why am I only finding out about this fucking terror now? I'm going to have nightmares. I'm going to be in the jungle be like, Ah! <laughs> Why? Snakes were bad enough! These snakes are mostly found in South Asia and the Indonesian archipelago. If you happen to live in any of those regions, I'm really sorry. The fire breathing is a bit of a problem, though. No animal has ever been able to breathe fire. However, some species have developed self-defense mechanisms that are somewhat similar. The bombardier beetle ejects a mixture of hydroquinone 
and as well as hydrogen peroxide and when exposed to air the chemicals mix causing an exothermic reaction basically creating a boiling hot fluid it may not be fire but it's pretty close and it's a fairly good start fire needs three things something to ignite the flame fuel and oxygen one possibility would be methane a byproduct of digestion that could be turned into methanol by some bacteria an animal would have to adapt a way to store and ignite the fuel and you have a dragon this is all very unlikely i know but it's not entirely impossible so who knows maybe just maybe we'll have real dragons one day just because it's <laughs> it's not, we're not evolution's not gonna go that way real dragons now normally i'd end a script about cryptids and mythological creatures with a triumphant grin proudly exclaiming well we have to go to the mystery and i suppose we have flying fire-breathing dragons condemning sinners to hell probably didn't exist but dragons are very real in fact not only are they real they're still around and they could use some assistance the komodo dragon is the largest lizard in the world and are now limited to a few small indonesian islands among them the island of komodo which is the longest but still which is the longest but still only 35 kilometers long that's 56 miles so the natural habitat is not exactly extensive Komodo dragons can be dangerous as are most animals when provoked and its bite contains potent venom that can kill an adult human <laughs> what's that i mean is, is, is it bad that the first thing that enters my mind is like why do we want to keep this fucker alive again <laughs> i mean he's just he can kill us let's get rid of him no i'm just kidding let's save those komodo dragons for some reason However, as with most animals, if you leave it alone, you should be fine. Unlike medieval dragons, Komodo dragons don't hunt people, sinners, or otherwise. Sadly, they're considered an endangered species, as there are only about 3,000 dragons left in the wild. They aren't the only dragons in Asia. You'll find the Chinese water dragon, that's a popular pet, and the Draco lizards, or flying lizards. Australia has the eastern water dragon, the bearded dragon, and here, in South Africa, oh, we have the smog. That's the dragon from The Hobbit, Simon. We have smog okay i've heard of this vaguely i've read the hobbit as i mentioned unfortunately i haven't seen the movie won't see the movie no interest in that okay it's not exactly smog it's a giant girdled lizard better known in these parts as a sun gazer reaching only around 12 to 20 centimeters in length that's about five to seven inches but it's the best we could do smog was named after the villain from the hobbit in honor of the author J.R. tolkien who was born in south africa unfortunately smog is facing its own, its own troubles that have nothing to do with dwarves or hobbits so far it's been nearly impossible to breed these lizards in captivity and due to poaching and the illegal animal trade their numbers are declining rapidly according to one source they could face complete extinction in the wild in as little as 10 years so if you have a love of reptiles and you want that kind of lizard and you want any kind of lizard as a pet make sure you buy your pet from a reputable breeder someone who both respects and loves reptiles as much as you do and not someone illegally catching them in the wild causing great damage to the species and everything else that depends on them in the name of profit conclusion it seems that these days you can't swing a cat without hitting a couple of dragons they're simply everywhere yeah game of thrones right they're in game of thrones as people talk about dragons lord of the rings all that kind of stuff that i don't follow like, i'm like dragons are around really i don't i don't see them because i don't follow any of that stuff for friendly night fairies that's the how to train your dragon franchise which i'm sure simon even simon knows because everyone with kids knows those dragons yeah my kids are too young for this though like i have heard of how to train your dragon but for when i was a kid like for me i tried watching something the other day watching kung fu panda and i was like this could be good because it's also fun for adults like they put jokes in there and they do things and you're like ah ah that's clever i like that and my daughter just said it was too scary she was like scary it's scary <laughs> okay back to bloody coco melon ba, 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 ba. i shoot myself in the face <laughs> god damn i can't wait to get onto some more like cool kid stuff uh to the ferocious beasts of the game of thrones franchise commanded by a rather tiny girl and everything in between clearly the image of dragons has shifted from the villain whose sole purpose was to get slayed by brave knights who apparently had little else to do to fierce protectors and companions to awkward teens dragons are a bit like movies everyone has a favorite personally i'm quite fond of errol from the discworld novels and of course toothless i also tried reading those discworld novels and just didn't get into it <laughs> <laughs> look guys i have tried fantasy extensively 
Today, most people accept that dragons are creatures of myth and fiction, but there are the occasional diehards like the creationists who believe dragons were dinosaurs no matter what science says. And that one guy in Florida who was arrested after trying to break into the Patrick Space Force Base in Brevard County, Florida with a stolen car in order to warn the US government about an imminent war between aliens and Chinese dragons. That guy needs to break into a psychiatric facility and stay there. I hope someone thanks him for the information, and if we're placing bets, my money's on the dragons. Aliens. No, no, no. Chinese dragons? The weird clam creatures versus aliens, which have come from another planet to our planet via some sort of technology which is going to be so incomprehensibly more advanced than we can understand. They will destroy those dragons. There won't be a competition. They will see the dragons as if you see a small ant and you're like, oh, that shouldn't be there, and you step on it. That will be it. The dragons will lose. I'm sorry, Elsa. A lot of people have pointed to literature, scripture, stories of legendary creatures passed from one generation to the next, fantastic tales to both entertain and educate to prove that dragons were real. However, as a student of literature, I can say one thing with confidence. The human imagination is an incredibly powerful thing. The tale of Beowulf is not an historical account of a Viking chief fighting off a dragon. It's a story about protecting the beer hall, the center point of the community. If we can accept tales from writers like Neil Gaiman as pure fiction stories meant to entertain, aren't we doing ancient storytellers a great disservice by assuming that all their stories had to be based in truth and fact that's a great point i really like that that's solid as we've already established on several of simon's channels the past was the worst so if there ever was a people that needed some form of escape who needed a hero to slay the imaginary dragons they themselves couldn't it was the folks being chased and eaten by wild predators it was the peasants and the poor people living in horrible conditions. So let's give storytellers the recognition they deserve and appreciate their stories as just that. Tales meant to entertain. And with that, I hope you were entertained by this episode of the show. If you did and you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe if you're listening as a podcast, a review would be just perfection. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.